What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook. So this is the third story in the series, um, Count the Ways. I have obviously already read this one. This is the final story in Into the Pit. Um, and this one is really good. I actually think it's underrated. I actually think a lot of people... Um, I, I really enjoyed this story and a lot of other people were saying that they didn't. I think it's quite underrated. Um, I really like the story, yeah. And there's going to be a lot of, of of good voice acting, I guess, I'm going to have to do in this. So um, I hope that you enjoy this. Uh, obviously, yeah, this isn't a first reaction like a lot of the other audiobooks that I've done in the past. But um, yeah, so let's get straight into this. Okay, count the ways. <clears throat> this is going to be really hard to do. Why, if it isn't Millie Fitzsimmons, a deep, booming voice said. I Okay, Li admittedly, it does say deep, booming voice, but this is the voice I'm going to go for, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, in the darkness, it was hard to tell exactly where it was coming from, but it felt like it was all around her. Silly Millie, chilly Millie, the ice-cold goth girl who's always dreaming of death. Am I right? Who are you? Millie demanded. Where are you? Above her, a large pair of terrifying blue eyes rolled backward, looking down into the chamber. I'm right here, silly Millie. Or maybe I should say you're right here. You're inside my belly. In the belly of the beast, I guess you could say. So, you're the bear? Millie wondered if she had fallen asleep after she climbed inside the old robot, or if she was dreaming. This was all too weird. You can just think of me as a friend. Your friend till the end. We just have to decide if the end is going to be slow or quick. I... I don't understand. The space was starting to feel claustrophobic. She tried the door. It wouldn't budge. You'll understand very soon, Chilly Millie. You goth girls crack me up. All dressed like professional mourners. So serious all the time, daydreaming about death like he's the lead singer of some boy band, and that when you'll meet him, it'll be love at first sight. Well, Merry Christmas, Millie. I'm gonna make your dreams come true. It's not a question of if, but how. What was happening? She was definitely awake. Had she lost her mind, descended into madness like a character in an Edgar Allan Poe story? I, I, I'd like to get out now she said. Her voice sounded small and shaky. Nonsense, the voice said. You're going to stay in here, all nice and cosy, while we work out how you're going to have your dream date with death. The choice is yours, but it will be my pleasure to present you with some options. Options of how to die? Millie felt the cold, metallic taste of fear in the back of her throat. Fantasies about death were one thing, but this felt like reality. <laughs> Off to a good start already. <laughs> I don't think I can keep that voice up for the next uh, <laughs> two hours or however long this is going to be. I don't know how long it's going to be. Um, but yeah. Millie. What a stupid name. She was named after her great-grandmother Millicent Fitzsimmons. But Millie wasn't the kind of name you saddled a person with. A cat or a dog maybe, but not an actual human. Millie's black cat was named Annabelle Lee, after the beautiful dead girl in the Edgar Allan Poe poem, which meant that Millie's cat officially had a better name than she did. But, Millie thought, it made sense that her parents would come up with such a ridiculous name. She loved them. But they were ridiculous people in a lot of ways. Flighty and impractical, the kind of people who would never think how hard elementary school would be for a little girl whose name rhymed with silly. Her parents flitted from job to job, from hobby to hobby, and now it seemed from country to country. Over the summer, Millie's dad had been offered a one-year teaching job in Saudi Arabia. Her mum and dad had, been, had given her a choice. She could go with them, it would be an adventure, her mum kept saying, and be homeschooled, or she could move in with her kooky grandpa for the year and start at the local high school. Talk about a lose-lose situation. After lots of crying and raging and sulking, Millie had finally chosen the kooky grand... I don't know if I'm saying that word right. Cookie? No, it's not cookie, it's kooky. 
Uh, Millie had finally chosen the kooky grandpa option over being stranded in a foreign country with her well-meaning but unreliable parents. And so now Millie was here in her strange little room in grandpa's big strange Victorian house. She had to admit, the idea of living in an old sprawling 150 year old house where surely someone had to have died at some point suited her well enough. The only problem was that it was filled to the brim with her grandparents junk. Millie's grandpa was a collector. Lots of people have collections of course, comic books or gaming cards or action figures, but grandpa didn't collect a, a specific type of thing so much as accumulate as a lot as accumulate a lot of different things. He was definitely a collector, but a collector of what? Millie wasn't sure. It all seemed very random. Looking around the living room, she could see old license plates and hubcaps hanging on one wall, old baseball bats and tennis rackets on another. A life-size suit of armor stood guard at one side of the front door, and a mangy-looking taxidermy bobcat stood at the other end, uh, at the other side, its mouth open and fangs bared in a menacing fashion. Uh, I just quickly want to say, um, because some of you might not have seen my audiobooks before, but um, first of all, I apologize for the highlights. Um, obviously, the first time I read this, I highlighted loads of things and now I can't get rid of them. <laughs> and uh, secondly, I am going to be stopping every now and then just to have a little talk. Um, this is the way I like to do my audiobooks and a lot of other people like it too. Um, so if you just want to hear like a like a full read through with no interruptions, then go and buy the audiobook. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> One glass case in the living room contained nothing but old porcelain baby dolls with tiny teeth and staring glass eyes. They were creepy and Millie tried to stay away from them, though they still showed up sometimes in her nightmares with those little teeth chomping at her. Her new bedroom had been her grandma's sewing room and it still contained the old sewing machine even though her grandma had died before Millie was born. Grandpa had moved into a narrow bed and a dresser to accommodate... Oh wait, no, Grandpa had moved in a narrow bed, not into, uh, and a dresser to accommodate Millie and her belongings and she had tried to make the room her own. She draped the bedside lamp with a sheer black lacy scarf so it gave off a muted glow. She covered the dresser with, with dripping candles and she hung posters of Kurt Carrion, her favourite singer on the walls. In one poster, the cover design for his album, Rigor Mortis, Kurt's, Kurt's lips were peeled back to reveal a set of metal fangs. A perfect red bead of blood glistened on his chin. The trouble was, though, that no matter how much Millie tried to match the room's decor to her personality, it never quite worked. The sewing machine was there and the wallpaper was cream coloured and decorated with tiny pink rosebuds, even with Kurt Carrion's fanged face glowering on the wall. There was something about the room that seemed sweet and old ladyish. Soup's on! I don't know why I gave it, I, I don't know why I gave Grandpa that accent. Um, Soup's on! <laughs> I just do a normal voice. Soup's on! Grandpa called from the bottom of the stairs. This was how he always announced dinner. And yet he had never once served soup. I'll be there in a minute, Millie yelled back. Not really caring whether she ate dinner or not, she dragged herself off the bed and made her way downstairs slowly, trying not to bump into or trip over any of the clutter that seemed to fill every square inch of space in the house. Millie met Grandpa in the dining room where the walls were decorated with souvenir plates printed with the names and landmarks of different states he had visited with Grandma when she was alive. The opposite wall displayed replicas of antique swords. Millie wasn't sure what those were about. Grandpa was every bit as weird as his collections. His wispy grey hair was always messy and wild, and he always wore the same ratty tan cardigan. He looked like he could play a wacky inventor in an old movie. Dinner is served, madame, Grandpa said, setting a bowl of mashed potatoes on the table. Millie sat at her place at the table and surveyed the visually disgusting meal. Mushy looking meatloaf, instant mashed potatoes and creamed spinach that she knew had been packaged and frozen in a solid block until he zapped it in the microwave. It was a meal you could eat even if you didn't have teeth, which Millie supposed went with the territory of having an old person cook for you. Millie loaded her plate with mashed potatoes since they were the only edible thing on the table. 
Now make sure you get some meatloaf and spinach too, Grandpa said, passing her the bowl of greens. You need the iron. You always look so pale. I like being pale. Millie wore a sheer light powder to make her face look even paler, paler, paler in contrast to the black eyeliner and black clothing she favoured. Well, Grandpa said, helping himself to meatloaf. I'm glad you don't bake yourself in the sun like your mother did when she was your age. Still, you could use a little colour in your cheeks. He held out the platter of meatloaf to her. You know I don't eat meat, Grandpa. Meat was gross, and also murder. Eat some spinach then, Grandpa said, spooning some out on her plate. Plenty of iron in it. You know, back when I learned to do the little bit of cooking I can manage, it was all about meat. Meatloaf, steaks, roast beef, pork chops. But if you help me find some vegetarian recipes, I'll, I'll sure try to cook them. It would probably be better for my health to eat less meat anyway. Minnie sighed and pushed the spinach around on her plate. Don't bother. It doesn't really matter whether I eat or not. Grandpa set down his fork. Of course it matters. Everybody's got to eat. He shook his head. There's no pleasing you there. Uh, there's no pleasing you. Is there, little girly? <laughs> I don't know why I put the word little there. Uh, I'm trying to be nice and figure out what you like. I want you to be happy here. Millie pushed her plate away. It's a waste of energy to try to make me happy. I'm not a happy person. And you know what? I'm glad. Uh, I'm not happy. Happy people are just lying to themselves. Well, if there's nothing in store for you but misery, I guess you might as well go get started on your homework, Grandpa said, and ate his last bite of mashed potatoes. Millie rolled her eyes and flounced out of the room. Homework was a misery. School was a misery. Her whole life was a misery. In her miserable room, Millie opened her laptop and searched for famous poems about death. She reread her old favourites. Annabelle Lee, the cat with the same name, was curled up on her bed. And The Raven by Poe. <laughs> Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. Um, then tried ones she'd never seen before by Emily Dickinson. The poem talked about death as a guy picking up a girl for a date, a date with death. The thought made Millie lightheaded. She thought of death as a handsome black cloaked figure, choosing her as one as the one he would take away from the boredom and misery of everyday life. She imagined he looked just like Kurt Carrion. Inspired, she grabbed her black leather journal and began to write. Oh death, show me now your ravaged face. Oh death, how I long for your chilly embrace. Oh death, my life is such a misery that only you can set me free. She knew poems didn't have to rhyme, but Edgar Allan Poe and Emily Dickinson rhymed, so she rhymed her poem too. Not bad, she decided. Sighing with dread of what uh, lay before her, she closed her journal and took out her homework. Algebra. What use was algebra in the face of human beings' inevitable mortality? None. Well, none except that if she didn't pass all her classes, her parents would cut off the allowance that her grandpa doled out to her every week, and she was saving up for more jet morning jewellery. She opened her algebra book, picked up her pencil, and began. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. What? Millie snapped and slammed her book shut, as if she'd been interrupted doing something she actually enjoyed. Grandpa nudged the door open with his foot. He was carrying a glass of milk and a plate of fragrant chocolate chip cookies. I thought you might need a little study fuel, he said. I know chocolate always did the trick for me. Grandpa, I'm not a little kid anymore, Millie said. You can't buy me happiness with a few cookies. Okay, Grandpa said, still holding the plate. You you want me to take them away then? No, Millie said quickly. Leave them. Grandpa shook his head, smiled a little, and set the plate and the glass on Millie's bedside table. I'm going to putter around in my workshop for an hour or so, girly, he called. Call me if you need anything. I won't need anything, Millie said, turning back to her algebra homework. She waited until she was sure he was gone, and then devoured the cookies. Wow. Ungrateful. <laughs> um, yeah. Options of how to die. Exactly, the voice in the darkness said. You're catching on now, bright girl that you are. Now I'd call the first couple of options to lazy choices. 
They don't require me to do anything but keep you here and let nature take its course. The advantage to these is that they're easy peasy for me, but not so easy for you. Slow, with lots of suffering. But who knows? That might appeal to your morbid sensibilities. Lots of opportunities for languishing. You like languishing? What do you mean? Millie asked. Whatever the answer was, she knew she wasn't going to like it. Dehydration is one option, the voice said. No water at all, and you could start dying in as few as three days or as many as seven. You're young and healthy, so I put my money on it taking you a while. Depriving the body of water has fascinating effects, with no fluids coming in to filter and flush. The kidneys shut down and your body starts poisoning itself, making you sicker and sicker. Once those poisons have time to build up, you can suffer total organ failure, or a heart attack or stroke. But that's death for you. So glamorous, so romantic. I need water right now. <laughs> Are you making fun of me? The voice that came out of Millie was tiny and soft, the voice of a scared little girl. Not at all, my dear. I like you, Millie, and that's why I'm here to make your wishes come true, like a genie, except you're the one that's trapped in a bottle. The voice stopped to chuckle. Starvation is another classic too, but that's really a slow-moving train. It takes weeks for the body to use up its stores of nutrition and break down its proteins and turn on itself. It can take weeks. Some people have even lasted a couple of months. Millie knew how Grandpa would rescue her before she could starve to death. That'll never work. Grandpa comes in here to putter around after dinner every night. He'll find me. How? The voice asked. He'll hear me in here. I'll scream. Scream or he want lamb chop. It's soundproof. No one will hear you. And anyway, after a few days, you'll be too weak to scream. Wow, a really loud motorbike just went past my window. Um, <laughs> winter break was just one week away, and the whole school was decorated with wreaths, uh, Christmas trees, and the occasional menorah. I don't know what that is. Millie didn't know why people got so excited over holidays. They were just a desperate attempt to invent some happiness in the face of life's utter meaningless. Well, they couldn't fool her. People could wish her Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays until they turned Santa Claus red in the face, but she wouldn't say it back. Not that people were going out of their way to wish Millie well. As she walked down the hall to the lunchroom, one blonde cheerleader, Millie didn't even know her name, said, I'm surprised to see you out in the daylight, Dracula's daughter. The cheerleader looked over at her equally blonde f friends, whom she'd been talking to more than she'd actually been talking to Millie, and they all laughed. The Dracula's Daughter thing had started because she had been carrying around a paperback copy of Bram Stoker's Dracula, and one of the jockey popular guys had said, Oh look, how sweet, she's reading a book about her dad. From then on, she'd been Dracula's daughter. Of course, everybody knew she was really Jeff and Audrey Fitzsimmons' daughter, which made her almost as much of a misfit as she would have been if Dracula were her real dad. The Fitzsimmons, um, uh, the Fitzsimmonses were kind of a joke in town, famous for their tendency to start projects with great enthusiasm and then abandon them. They had brought a run-down but once beautiful colonial house when Millie was ten, and had thrown themselves into refur refurbishing it. They had kept it up for about three months until they ran out of time, money and energy. As a result, the house had a weird patchwork quality. The living room and the kitchen were repainted and had new fixtures, but the bedroom still had old peeling wallpaper and floors with squeaky boards. The bathroom pipes screamed when you turned on the water and the ancient tub, sink and toilet never looked clean no matter how much they were scrubbed. The most talked about thing though was the exterior of the house. Millie's dad had repainted the front and one side a nice soft blue with cream, with cream trim. But paint was expensive, painting was exhausting and he didn't really, and he, and he really didn't like getting up on ladders. As a result, the front of the house was painted beautifully, 
but the back and other side were still covered with old flaking white paint. Millie's mum said nobody would notice. It was like when people arranged the Christmas trees the ugly side faced the wall. People noticed. People also noticed the Fitzsimmons' inability to keep a steady job. Millie's parents were always coming up with some new scheme that finally was going to bring them the success of their dreams. One year her mum was making candles and selling them at the farmer's market, while her dad started a nutritional supplement store that closed its doors after six months. After that, her mum and dad started a store that sold yarn and knitting supplies, and they might have made a go of it if either of her parents had known more about yarn and knitting. And then they bought a food truck, even though they were both terrible cooks. Millie couldn't understand how her parents could remain so optimistic with failure after failure. But they did. They attacked each new project with huge enthusiasm. And then after a few months, both the project and the enthusiasm fizzled out. They weren't poor exactly. They, there was just always food to eat. Even if, toward the end of the month, it tended to dwindle to pancake mix and boxed macaroni and cheese. But there was always worry about how the bills would get paid. Millie knew that her grandpa helped them out some months. Her grandpa was also considered weird in town but was cut some slack because he was old and a widower and had been an excellent high school math teacher for many years. As a result, he earned the title of eccentric instead of weird. Some people said that maybe by taking this teaching job in Saudi Arabia, Jeff was finally getting it together and following in his dad's footsteps. Millie knew, though, that her dad would fritter away this opportunity like he had so many others. So, Dracula's daughter or Jeff and Audrey Fitzsimmons' daughter, either one was a one-way ticket to being a social outcast. In the cafeteria, Millie took a second to adjust to the deafening din of hundreds of teenagers talking and laughing. She walked past a table full of popular girls and saw her best friend from elementary school, Hannah, sitting with them, laughing at something all the other girls were laughing about. Millie and Hannah had been inseparable from kindergarten through fifth grade, playing on the swings or jumping rope together at every recess and playing dolls or board games at each other's houses after school. But in middle school, popularity started to be more and more important to Hannah, and she drifted away from Millie and toward the crowd who was always giggling about clothes and boys. What Millie understood that... Uh, what Millie understood, but Hannah did not, was that those girls never accepted Hannah as more than a hanger-on. Hannah lived in a plain little house in a plain little neighbourhood and didn't have the money or social status to make the cut. The popular girls didn't push her away, but they never let her into their inner circle either. It made Millie sad that Hannah preferred to accept crumbs from the popular girls rather than friendship, rather than real friendship from her. But then a lot of things made Millie sad. Millie sat alone, nibbling on the egg salad sandwich and apple slices her grandpa had packed for her and reading tales of mystery and imagination. She was trying, uh, sorry, she was managing to drown out all the cafeteria noise and focus on the story she was reading, The Fall of the House of the Usher. Roderick Usher, the main character in the story, couldn't bear noise of any kind. But then she felt herself being watched. She looked up from her work to see a lanky boy with horn-rimmed glasses and frizzy hair that had been dyed fire engine red. Both his ears were studded with silver earrings. Millie coveted his black leather jacket. Hi, um, I was wondering, he nodded at the chair across from Millie. Is anybody sitting there? Was this guy asking to sit with her? Nobody ever asked to sit with her. My imaginary friend, Millie said. Wait, was that a joke? She, she never joked with people. The boy grinned, revealing a mouthful of braces. Well, would your imaginary friend mind if I sat in her lap? Millie looked at the imaginary chair for a second. She says, suit yourself. Okay, he said, setting the tray down. Thanks to both of you. I don't really know anybody yet. I'm new. Nice to meet you new. I'm Millie. Wait, she was a comedian now? My name's Dylan, actually. I just moved here from Toledo. I don't know where that is. <laughs> uh, he gestured toward her book. His fingernails were short, but polished black. Love that. Um, a Poe fan, huh? Millie nodded. Me too, Dylan said. And H.P. Lovecraft. I love all the scary old writers. 
I've never read Lovecraft, Millie said. Better to be honest than try to fake knowledge and talk herself into a corner. I've heard of him, though. Oh, you'd love him, Dylan said, dunking a cafeteria-issued chicken nugget into a puddle of ketchup. Super dark and twisty. He looked around the cafeteria, his face a mask of disdain. So, is this school as lame as it seems? Lamer, Millie said, marking her place in her book and shutting it. The House of Usher wasn't going anywhere, and she couldn't remember when she'd last had an interesting conversation. Well, I'll tell you what, Dylan said, gesturing with a french fry. So far, you're the only person I've seen here who seems cool. Millie felt her face heating up. She hoped a blush wouldn't pink on her pallor. Thanks, she said. I, uh, like your jacket, and I like your earrings. She reached up to touch one of the black teardrops that hanged from her earlobes. Thanks, they're jet. Victorian morning jewellery. I know, Dylan said. He knew? What kind of high school guy knew about Victorian morning jewellery? I have a few pieces of it, Millie said. I mostly find them on, e on eBay. I can't afford my favourite kind though, which is... Dylan put up his hand. Wait, don't tell me. It's the kind where they weave the hair of the dead person into the jewellery, right? Yes, Millie said, shocked and amazed. Those pieces show up sometimes on eBay, but they always cost a fortune. The bell rang, signalling that lunch period was about to end. Dylan leaned toward Millie and half whispered, Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee, Millie finished. Where had this guy come from? Toledo, sure. But how is he so sophisticated and knowledgeable? She had never met anyone like him. Dylan stood up. Millie, it's been a rare pleasure. Would you and your imaginary friend mind very much if I joined you two at lunch tomorrow? Millie felt the corners of her mouth twitch in an unfamiliar way. We wouldn't mind at all, she said. God, here we go again. <laughs> See, I thought about freezing you to death, the voice said. I thought I could short out the power in here so the space heater turns off and my metal body can get pretty cold. But I figured your grandpa would come in and notice the power is out in his precious workshop and it would fix and would fix it right away. So freezing to death is a no-go. So if you had your heart set on that one, sweet pea. Millie was shivering, not from the cold, but from fear. I don't understand. Why do you want to kill me? Interesting you should ask, the voice said. There are a couple of reasons, actually. The first is quite simply that it's something to do. I sat in a salvage yard for years. Oh, sorry, for ages before your grandpa found me and brought me here, where I've just been sitting too, bored out of my skull. Not that I have a little skull, but you know what I mean. Aren't there other things you could find to do besides, you know, killing people? Minnie asked. Whatever this being was, it was obviously intelligent. Maybe she could reason with it. None so interesting. And plus, there's my second reason, which is that death is what you want. You've been mooning around since you moved here, talking about how you want to die. Well, I like to kill people, and you want to die. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. Like those little birds that pick the parasites off rhinoceroses. The bird gets to eat, and the rhinoceroses get rid of itchy little bugs. We both get what we want. Win-win. Millie suddenly realised that she'd spoken of death, written about it, but it had always been just an interesting idea to play around with. She never intended to take any action to make it a reality. But I don't want to die. Not really. A horrible rumbling sound surrounded Millie and shook the body of the machine that trapped her. It took a... It took her a few seconds to recognise the sound as laughter. For dinner, Grandpa made spaghetti with marinara, uh, God, marinara sauce, garlic bread and Caesar salad. It was much better than the meals he usually slung together. You're actually eating tonight, Grandpa said. Because this is actually good, Millie said, twirling spaghetti on her fork. Alright, I, I, I finally found something... God, I'm stumbling over my words now. I finally found something you like to eat, Grandpa said. I'll add it to my limited repertoire. I kept the sauce meatless for you and added meatballs to mine, so everybody's happy. Herbivores and carnivores alike. Well, happy might be stretching it, 
Minnie said, unwilling to admit that she actually had kind of a good day. But the spaghetti is good, and my day at school didn't totally stink. And what made the day less stinky than usual? Grandpa asked, spearing a meat ball. I met someone who seems kind of cool. Really? A girl someone or a boy someone? Millie didn't like Grandpa's insinuating tone. Well, not that it matters, but it happens to be a boy. Don't try to turn it into some kind of love story, though. We just had a decent conversation, is all. A decent conversation is something, especially these days. Most people your age wouldn't look up from their phones long enough to say as much as, How do you do? Grandpa said. Not to put the cart before the horse, but I met your grandma when I was a little older than you are now. So what? Now you have me engaged to this guy I just met? Grandpa. I'm 14. Grandpa laughed. You're right that you're too young to be engaged, and your grandma and I didn't get engaged when we were teenagers either. But we were high school sweethearts, and then we went to the same college. We got engaged our senior year of college and married in June right after we graduated. He smiled. And it all started with a good conversation at lunch, like you had today. So... You never know. Slow down, old man, Millie said, fighting off with a smile. Oh, fighting off a smile, sorry. Uh, Grandpa's eyes went soft and misty. I'm just reminiscing. I wish you could have known your grandma, Millie. She, she was really something special, and to lose her when she wasn't even 40. It's like Annabelle Lee, Millie said. The Poe poem? Grandpa asked. It was many and many a year ago in the kingdom by the sea. Yes, I guess it was something like that. You know Poe? Millie asked. It was weird to hear him recite one of her favourite poems. It is a good poem, to be fair. Grandpa was a math person. She didn't expect him to know anything about poetry. Believe it or not, I'm a pretty literate old dude. I like Poe and a lot of other writers, too. I know you like Poe because he's dark and spooky, and it's easy to romanticise death when you're young and it's too far away. But Poe didn't write about death because he thought it was romantic. He wrote about it because he lost so many of the people he loved. You've never experienced that kind of loss, Millie. It changes you. He blinked hard. You know, for years after she died, friends were always trying to fix me up with other women. But it never worked. She was the only one for me. Just like in the poem. <laughs> Millie had never really thought about Grandpa's feelings before. Now, he must have felt... Uh, sorry, how he must have felt when Grandma got sick and died. How lonely he must have been after she was gone. How he might still be lonely now. That must have been hard, she said. Losing Grandma? Grandpa nodded. It was. I still miss her every day. Well, thanks for dinner. I guess I'd better get started on my homework. Without being asked, Grandpa said, smiling. This is certainly a special day. In her room, Millie didn't think of death. She thought of Dylan, and she thought about what Grandpa had said about Grandma. When she recited Annabelle Lee in her head this time, it seemed like a poem about love instead of a poem about death.